Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Psychology Podcast. I am your host, Daniel Curry. In my podcast, I interview extraordinary people and pick their brains. Each episode will feature a guest who will stimulate your mind and give you a different perspective on the many paths that can lead to a rich and fulfilled life. This includes their favorite books, morning routines, exercise habits, trade secrets, nutritional philosophies, and their overall take on happiness and success. My goal is to find out where those amazing people get their holistic results from so that you and I can use their tactics and go kick ass in life as well. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy today's episode. I would like to start the interview by asking you, if people ask you what you do, what do you say to them? Because you do so many things. <laughs> yeah, um, I usually say, it depends on who I'm talking to, right? What do I say and how much detail? But I usually, these days, I say that I'm a behavioral scientist and I work at the intersection of uh, behavioral science and technology. Yeah, that's and then they don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was the first moment that you fell in love with psychology? Oh, wow. That's an interesting question. You know, um, I think I fell in love with the psychology in general without realizing I was falling in love with psychology. You know, when I was a kid, we moved a lot. We moved about once a year on average. And um, when you move a lot like that, you become, um, at least I did, an observer of people and relationships. So I had to kind of learn, you know, how do you make friends? I'm talking about when I was little, you know, how do you make friends with people you don't know and you don't have any connection to? And, you know, what makes people willing to bring you into their little circle at school and what makes them not? And so I think I was actually a fan of psychology without realizing that that's what I was studying was human behavior. Uh, when I um, officially, you know, when I went to college, I I actually didn't start as a psychology major, uh, but what did you uh, start somewhere in? along, I started as um, a I did <laughs> I was going to school that had quarters, not semesters, so there were three quarters a year, four quarters a year actually. Um, I started as political science that lasted one quarter, and then I switched to English and that lasted one quarter, <laughs> and then I switched to pre med mm. that lasted a little over a year, uh, and then. I uh, actually dropped out of college and moved and then started back at night. And uh, that's when I started psychology. So uh, it was my last two years of undergraduate. So I and then I really got into it in a big way. So maybe you could say I really fell in love with it, you know, my third year of college. But I think I always was kind of fascinated by people and why they do what they do. This was one of the reasons why I wanted to interview you, because uh, I studied habits under Professor Falk, and he reminds me a bit of yourself because you you do too have like those you have a talent for taking a complicated problem and making it understandable for people. And this is was one of the reasons why I wanted to write a book because there's like so much papers which are so hard to read Very for, dense, for, for yeah. people, uh, even for me, and it's it's like my great obsession and. I think this information should be available for everybody. And I wanted to ask you now you have, because you are somewhat in, in, the, in, in my future of where I will probably end up when I study yeah. psychology all my life, which is very yeah. interesting for me. What is it like for you to go through the world and having all this excessive knowledge <laughs> of how things work and you go to a supermarket and you know, ah, he's wanting to buy something. Ah, there uh, you go. Yeah, it's... Um... You know, it's kind of like a, a fun and interesting and then a curse at the same time um, to, you know, it, it's interesting. I've, I've, I, I've also, one of the things I've been doing maybe the last 10 years or so is um, uh, mindfulness meditation mm -hmm. and, you know, the whole idea of just accepting what is you know, observing, accepting, letting go. And I think one of the reasons that that has been important to me is because I see too much, you know, and, and, you know, I'm always, 
uh, I'll have conversations with my husband. He's a newspaper editor, you know, and he's mm. really into politics and world events. And, you know, why are people, do, why would people think that way? Why would people do that? And then I just look at him and I go, that's just the way people are, you know? So kind of knowing the stuff we know about psychology and people and why they're the way they are, I think you, for me, I had to balance that with it just accepting it and not judging it because otherwise you start to really kind of go, go nuts, go a little crazy, you know, cause you see all this human behavior, you know, and you're like, yeah, that's what people do. And so I had to just get to the point where I could say, yeah, that's what people do. And, you know, try to not have it kind of bother me so much. I can relate. I'm in that, uh, my head is going to explode face yeah, right yeah. now because I, somewhat by accident created a system around myself which my, with my book club my podcast and writing a book that i'm learning about psychology 24 so much and you just have it's, all this stuff coming yeah in, and sometimes you know? i yeah. miss it just like walking through the city <laughs> <laughs> and not yeah, like being not fascinated noticing. by yeah, every little thing that. oh yeah. that's interesting and oh, what does yeah. that mean and oh, right. excessively um i wanted to ask you knowing what you know now what advice could you give a first time author for writing a book? Oh goodness. I was just recording a podcast interview right before this call for my podcast where we were interviewing David Travis. Do you know David? I, know, I don't know David he's Travis. He's a he's a, a user experience person. He has a PhD in psychology. Ooh. He uh, just wrote a book about doing uh, user experience research, but we were talking about writing books and I asked him, you know, do you like writing books? Do you hate writing books? Is it love, hate? And, you know, because I have found that for um, everybody, it's a totally different experience. I don't think, I mean, even I have found that my experience writing my, all my books each book was a different experience. So I don't know that there's any one one way to write a book. I think everybody kind of has their own way of doing it. And I think part of that is the place that you're at, you know, psychologically at a given point in time when you're writing it. And part of it is the book you're writing and the type of book and you know, because I've written books, um, you know, if you're, for instance, I wrote the uh, couple of the hundred things, but you know, hundred things every designer needs to know about people. And that book, because there were a hundred things and I had to make it exactly a hundred things, <laughs> like there couldn't be 107 things and there couldn't be 93 things, you know, it had to work out to be a hundred and then I had to group the hundred things into some kind of categories. So that was a really different experience than, for instance, when I wrote the book, How to Get People to Do Stuff, which didn't have to have. I got it here. You know, <laughs> oh, look at that. I love it. Didn't have to have, you know, separate little things. So I think every book is different. Um, and then every writer is different. So, I mean, I can give you, you know, let's see, if I had to say what are tips and techniques for writing. All mistakes that you did in the beginning that uh, robbed yeah. your, your sanity that you wouldn't repeat. Oh, are there any mistakes that I wouldn't repeat? You know, I don't know that there are because, and I say that because I think that maybe because of my experience and my work in the field of design and usability and user experience, you know, I have this idea of iterative work. And so I just assumed that I wasn't making mistakes. Uh, I was just iterating. What does it mean? Iterating? Um, it means I gave myself permission to redo, ah. to do over, uh -huh. to try again to scrap an idea totally. So, you know, if I want to, you know, I'm thinking, oh, I know I'll organize the book this way or I'll talk about this, then I would try it. And then if that didn't work, I would just say, oh, I guess that doesn't work and just scrap it and try something else. I didn't feel at all like I had to start the book and then go through this, you know, continuous process, uh, you know, very logical and organized. I didn't 
I didn't feel that way at all. Um, the other thing is that, you know, I I actually um, did a whole course on the science of creativity. So there's a real science around how your brain works when you're working on something creative and writing a book is creative. And so there are, um, you, know, you really need these time periods where you step away from everything and don't work on anything mental. Like you have to clear what's called your executive attention network, right? You know, you got to have it not work on anything. And so I would give myself uh, you know, I kind of set the problem. So for instance, I can't figure out a good way to organize this. I just can't, I can't figure out what the chapters would be. You know, I know the little things I want to talk about. I do not see at all how to put this into a hole that makes sense. And then I would, so I would say, that's what I need to figure out. And then I'd walk away from it and I wouldn't work on the book for, you know, hours or days because I knew that that question my the my the creative networks in my brain were working to solve it and then i would you know then i'd be like washing dishes or in the shower or on a walk and all of a sudden i'd get this you know idea oh and so i really gave myself freedom to let my brain <laughs> um, do what it wants to do but you know a lot of writing a book is just painful i mean i literally painful. You know what I'm talking about. I mean, I would sit down and it was like, I'm working on the book today and I would feel like my muscles would be tight. I'd feel pain, mental pain, physical pain. <laughs> um, you know, I'd, be, I'd be like, okay, I'm going to, I will, I'm going to write, you know, I have to write for 20 more minutes before I can take a break. I mean, I would like, you know, I'd have to force myself. And also when I'm writing a book, my house is very clean mm. because I take constant breaks because <laughs> I, I don't want to write the book. And so I'm looking for distractions. And if you're cleaning, then you feel like, you know, well, I'm not goofing off, you know. So it's tough. Writing a book is just tough. And it, I find so it also the other thing that's interesting is all the things besides writing the text that take a lot of time, like, you know, uh, uh, getting all the reference citations formatted just right. Oh my God, you know, that'll kill you. Um, <laughs> you know, writing for permission for the illustrations or having to create new illustrations, all the things besides writing the text that take an enormous amount of time. I don't know if people realize that there's all this other stuff. You know? I listened to an, another interview of you, and this was my favorite part where you said that your creativity comes in waves and your productivity you allow yourself to have those highly functional phases but you are somewhat forgiving yeah i think anybody who's done anything creative whether it's art or i i also write music so mm -hmm. whether it's art or music or writing books or putting together a presentation or a course you know that's all creative you're coming up even if you're not coming up with brand new ideas you're coming up with new ways of putting the ideas together so it's still creative and yeah you're going to go through cycles where you are like super super productive and then you're going to have other time periods where it's like you just you're not productive you can't get it together you don't have any ideas and you really have to be forgiving of that and um and I think it has, you know, I, I do think I taught whatever interview this was you heard or saw, I probably talked about the cycles, right? Yeah. You, people have cycles of, of really pro productive time and then not so productive. And if you are aware of your cycles, like if you know you tend to work in a, you know, six week on, six week off or six week on, three months off or you know, <laughs> whatever your cycle is, it helps because then when you're in this down state um, where you're not being feeling very creative where you're not having ideas where you're not being very productive instead of getting down on yourself you can just say oh well i must you know this is my non-productive phase and i can make a little bit of progress but i'm not going to make a lot of progress right now but i also have confidence that it's going to end you know and i'll i'll be able to rev back up at least that's what i have found <laughs> and, uh, that's beautiful because i I am I'm a former basketball player, so I, I grew up in a mindset that 
when you don't feel completely exhausted and your body hurts you haven't trained enough and for any intellectual pursuits this this mindset can be poisonous because there yeah. there is no physical breakpoint anymore so, right right and really like this was one of the first thing that i struggled because I found that I have this high capacity for obsession and that I it's very easy for me to discard everything and that I would just dig my own hole, so to speak, after weeks. And this was what I found interesting about you is that you have this lightheartedness about you, or <laughs> at, at least so you appear on, on screen. I appear to have a yeah, you appear on screen, but when you look at your achievements and, and uh, your, your career, you got to have this this... I think you must have this fire and obsession in you too. How do you balance that out? Yeah, I do. I, I mean, I, I can, I can get very intensely focused. Um, I, I can get about some things and not others, you know, real perfectionist tendency, which is, which is good, right? In the, in that it means you care a lot about what you're doing and you pay a lot of attention, but it's also bad because, you know, it means you might not get anything completed if it has to be absolutely perfect. So I do kind of struggle with that. Um, you know, I, I think one of the things that uh, uh, allows me to, to be productive and, you know, create a lot of stuff, right, is that uh, I really love the work that I do. I really enjoy it. It's, it's, um, it's so much of who I am. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I definitely have time, time in my day and time in my life, in my year where I'm not work, working, but not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, because I really, I really like, the work that I do. And I feel very blessed that I've been able to, you know, make a career, right. And, and make enough money to, you know, pay my bills and such doing the things that I find really interesting or exciting. I mean, I really love, you know, I don't love writing the books, but I love the topic of the books. And I love reading other books about this. And, you know, speaking and teaching. So, so there's just kind of like, um, you know, some of it is just hard work and not a lot of fun. Right. Uh, but even those times are okay because it's, I'm, you know, the not so fun thing I might be doing, you know, like formatting the research citation. Uh, but it's in the service of the stuff that I, I really love. So I think that that's, I think that that's a lot to do with it. I think the only, I think the only way to, you know, write a book, uh, teach a class, give us, give speeches or do consulting or whatever it is you're doing with your work. The only way to do that over a long period of time, um, is if you really love it, especially being, you know, I have my own business and, uh, there's just no way you can sustain that unless you love it. Cause it's going to be, it's going to be tough. So you've, you've got to really like what you're doing to do this kind of stuff we're doing. Um, I mean, you know, I, I think everyone should be able to have a job that they, that they love. And I know that that isn't always the case. So, um, I think also, uh, Um, I, I think part of it for me is I love teaching people stuff. And so, you know, writing a book or giving a presentation or giving a speech to me is all about, um, essentially saying, isn't this stuff really fun? <laughs> Wouldn't you, don't you, every, you want to learn about this, right? Isn't this really fun? Isn't this really interesting? So I think that that that's uh, part of it too. I just have this natural thing about wanting people wanting to share all the things that I think are really cool and fun. I agree. And psychology, I feel is different because it's basically learning a superpower, or at least <laughs> this is how I feel about it. And when more people know about it, you understand everything, everything that's in this world is, is made by humans and to some extent. And I wanted to ask you, you were speaking about having a job that you love. How do you mm -hmm. deal with 
when you have other people in your life who are living under their their potential because one thing that, that I struggle with is because because I understand the potential of our brain just from a hardware standpoint what you can install on, on software on it and just seeing so many people not even grasping what's what's uh, could be a reality for them how do you deal with that yeah I mean you know I think this is remember when I said you I, I've had to teach myself how to accept yeah. <laughs> Stuff. I mean, yeah. that's where that comes in, you know. Yeah. Well, um, you know, it's one thing. I think there are people who are maybe have a job that doesn't use their full potential, uh, but they, that's what they want. That's fine. You know, it doesn't bother them. They uh, they don't want work to be everything to them. They have other priorities that are more important, and the work part is just so that they can. Uh, you know, have enough money coming in to do the things they love. And so, you know, I think that's one thing to, to understand. You know, I, I've, I have sometimes taught workshops and and about um, reaching your life goals. And, and uh, I think it's really important to separate uh, what you do, that is what you love to do, and how you earn your money. So, for some people, and I'm one of those people, the two are joined. So, you know, the work I love to do is also how I pay my bills. But for a lot of people, that's not true. And it doesn't have to be true. And I think a lot of people get really hung up on that and really stuck and frustrated because they want to take their passion and they want to have that be how they pay their bills. And that may not be realistic or it may not be a good idea. Uh, I've had people tell me, you know, when I, I, I loved, you know, doing X, Y, Z, but then when I had to do it for money, I hated it, you know? So I think you have to, um, you know, you have to know what you care about and what you're passionate about and what's important to you and how you're going to put that into your life. And then I think you have to figure out what kind of skills and strengths you have that will best and best enable you to use those skills and strengths and pay your bills, but that doesn't necessarily have to be what you love. So when I meet people who, you know, like you said, you know, well, they're not using their full potential in their work, you know, at, so be it. Um, but it is true. One thing I do get frustrated with that I have to stop, you know, the other thing is I'm an entrepreneur, right? And, and people who are entrepreneurs, like I am just constantly, anyone I meet and we have a conversation and I have like 10 ideas of how they could turn that into a business and make money out of it. You know, it's like my, my brain is just, zzz, and you know, they'll look at me and they'll go, I can't think of anything I could do that <laughs> to make money. Yeah. And I'm like, I just, I just thought of 10 things mm. and told you about them. And you like, don't, hello, hello, don't you see it, you know, mm. and they just don't see it. And I, and I, I, initially I'm like, I don't get it. Why don't they see this? Uh, and then I have to stop and say, you know, some people just don't think like that for a variety of reasons. I think some of it is confidence, you know, um, uh, and they might actually be more realistic <laughs> And I am, you know, like I would probably jump into some of these business ventures that would totally flop and they're just being more realistic. But I, you know, again, it comes down to acceptance. You just have to accept that, you know, this is the way someone is for whatever reason. And, uh, you know, we're, we're human. You know, that's what I like to say. We're just human. Mm. You know, I interviewed uh, Dr. Art Markman about this topic and he has a, uh, a uh, great example in his book, Smart Change, where he talks about that people are very bad at identifying when they are systematically failing. And this is some, Interesting. something that I that never was very obvious to me is that pe people who are really struggling, who make the same mistakes over and over yeah. again, are very rarely aware of it. Like Really? Yeah, oh, that is like, interesting. It's huh? a classical addictive mindset kind of, kind, kind of thing. It's because we... Everything we do, we have a tendency to justify it to ourselves in, in order to do it. It's the, yeah. You wake up every weekend with a hangover and you minimize it by saying, oh, that's okay. It was just, that's just the way it is. So you can continue doing it. But from afar, 
like it's it's painfully obvious that this person is might be well, ruining his life right now. And you know, I don't know that studying psychology really helps you escape from that. You know, sometimes people say to me, "Oh, you know, you know all this stuff now, like about how people behave and and uh, cognitive bias and so on." So that must mean that you know you you're immune to all these things, right? You don't, and it's like no. I it, the only difference is that after I make uh, after I'm influenced by the marketing and advertising and make a decision that I maybe shouldn't have made mm. later on, I realize it <laughs> and why I did it, but it doesn't prevent it from happening. And, you know, based on what you were just saying, I, you know, I was thinking about the fact that, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get surprised myself, uh, you know, when someone else reflects to me on my behavior and then I'll go, oh, mm. wow, I, that's right. You know, so I didn't see it. So just being, you know, knowing about psychology doesn't mean that you're necessarily aware of your own, you know, stuff you're doing. I think you even gave a speech on YouTube about uh, visual psychology, the perspective of things, and that we need to blend out a lot of things in order to focus on what's really important right now for our brains. Right. So maybe we are hardwired to do that. And this is one of the reasons why I'm in this phase that my head is about to explode because <laughs> behavior change is not an individual endeavor. It is maybe I can design the apartment that I'm living in, but all the stores around me in my neighborhood are not, they are not my decision or the city right. that, that I live in. And, Right. Uh, and I have the privilege of, do you know Anne Thorndike? No. She, she did some, uh, she's a professor in Harvard and medical professor in Harvard. She did some great uh, studies about beverage choices in a hospital in Massachusetts, I think, and where they manipulated the environment and they just put more water in the cafeteria to see if they were drinking more water instead of soda. And the results were profound. So our environment is really... It's, yes, it's, it's crazy. And this is also like, how fair is this world? I mean, we do we really choose our habits Do we really choose our environments, something that I struggle with from from giving people the idea of free choice to some extent. But but I'm drifting. <laughs> I, have, okay. I have questions I need to ask you. I will talk with okay. you about some else. Uh, okay. you, wrote, you wrote a book about persuasion and motivation. Can you tell yeah. us a little bit about the story of how to get people to do stuff. What's the idea? How does this baby was born? Boy, I have to try and think, how did I end up right with that book? Uh, or why, why did I come up with that idea? You know, I'm not even sure. I mean, I had written, uh, I had written a book on, uh, called Neural Web Design, What Makes Them Click. That was one of my earlier books uh, on on psychology and, and design. And, you know, in that book, I talked a lot about psychology. And for some reason, that got me thinking about um, what motivates people to take action. And, you know, psychology is such a big field, right? And, and I just had this idea, whether it was a silly idea or not, that I could kind of explain all of psychology, all of human motivation as seven different drivers, seven things that drive us. And um, that's, I just decided to, to go for it. And, and, you know, so it's kind of my worldview about how the field of psychology, what it can tell us about what uh, gets people to do certain things and motivates people to take action. Um, and I think it's, in, I, I find it interesting and useful. You know, I, to, I mean, there are marketing people and design people and parents and, you know, that, that read that book. Um, and I, to me, what I think is important is I think that we, because a lot of people don't, you know, haven't studied psychology, don't have a PhD in psychology, they, we tend to fall back on particular techniques to motivate people uh, without realizing that there are other choices that might be better. So for instance, you know, if, if you, at, I'm constantly brought into companies to, for consulting and, 
you know, they want to, they're trying to motivate, you know, we would like to motivate people to use the software more. We'd like to motivate our salespeople to sell more. We'd like to, you know, whatever it is. And typically what they're using is rewards. Mm. You know, that's, yeah, people just go, you know, oh, you want to motivate someone, give them a reward. And, you know, the research shows us that that's not, you know, can sometimes be effective, but often isn't. And then, you know, they don't understand why didn't this work. And so, you know, I'll go in and help them understand why it didn't work in their particular situation, but also uh, open their eyes to the fact that, you know, there's probably better ways to motivate people than rewards in this situation. So, yeah, I, I just thought it would be kind of a fun, interesting thing to do to kind of look at psychology just from the motivational lens and and help people understand that there's a lot of different ways to motivate people to take action that are going to be much more powerful. I can relate to some extent. I had the idea of writing an entire book about behavior, which is <laughs> turned, <laughs> turned out. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big topic. <laughs> it's just too big, but I was just interested. So I had to, I had to write it to some extent and just articulating the problems, for example, why people struggle to change is so difficult. And that's a great topic just right there. Yeah, why do people struggle to change? Yeah, that's, yeah. And one thing, two things from, from your book and your work that really interested me, this was first, you wrote a great article for psychology today, which is called the dopamine reward loop, which I, which I really like because a lot of people have this classical idea that that Duhag promotes. So Charles Duhag promotes in his book *The Power of Habits* is that our behavior is really driven by rewards. And um, can you tell us a little bit about about this loop, so I don't butcher butcher your idea there? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I mean it's a it's a complicated field, but um, and I love, by the way, I love Duhag's book on on habits. Actually, uh, the part of um, his book that I think is the best, it, and I, it, he is in the appendix. Did you read that? Yeah. I got, you know, I read the book and I thought, yeah, it's pretty good. And then I got to the appendix and it's like, why did you bury this mm. in the appendix? I thought that was the best part. But anyway, um, it's the exercises, right? Yeah. It's yeah. like, oh, okay, there you go. Mm. That now, you know, that's what's really important. So, Really, I think the best work about about this whole idea of rewards and dopamine is is from Sapolsky. Do you know Robert Sapolsky? Robert Sapolsky wrote me the most uh, nicest rejection letter ever. Oh, he did. <laughs> what what was he rejecting? You I, for? I was uh, writing him for an interview for my very first podcast where I didn't have any social proof or whatever. And I was just delighted that he wrote me almost a page back that he would love to talk to me. <laughs> About why he wasn't going to talk yes, to Yes, it was such a nice guy knowing how much he has on his plate. So that was really a, a, a well, weird he's, success yeah, story. He's, a, he's mm. wonderful, but he's got this explanation that I don't know that he's written it in a book. I saw him talk about it on a video. So let's take the typical reward, you know, rat, a rat scenario, right? So you put a rat in a cage and you train the rat that when a light comes on, if the rat will run over and press a bar, then he'll get a food pellet. And you train him that way. Light comes on, run over, press the bar, the food comes out. Uh, now, what, uh, what Sapolsky talks about is if you um, actually measure the dopamine levels during that process. Um, so now what we have is uh, the light comes on, the rat will run over and press the bar. Sometimes he'll get a treat when he does that, and sometimes he doesn't. And if we measure the dopamine, um, the light comes on, the dopamine spikes up immediately. The rat runs over, presses the bar, the dopamine drops. So, so you know, people used to think, well, dopamine was when you get a reward. But actually, this research shows that dopamine is not when you get a reward. It's in, in anticipation of the reward. And Kent Barrage, I don't know if you know him, um, but he wrote back in the 1990s, he did, a, he did research and wrote about the fact that um, dopamine 
uh, well, I mean, dopamine is released all through your body and your brain. It does all kinds of things. But one of the things it does is it uh, gets us to act. It gets us to take action. And um, and and so what this ho- this idea of the dopamine loop is, you uh, you know, something happens, like for the rat, the light went off. But for us, it might be, you know, we see a headline that's interesting, right? And so the dopamine is going to, spike, which is going to make us click to read the article, right? And, and that in itself, just getting information is, can be like a reward, but it's just the fact that we did something. And then of course, now you see, you know, another article talked about in that article. And so that dopamine goes up again and you know now i anticipate learning more and so i click again but now i'm off on something then i see an ad on the screen for you know a shirt i am interested in and so i click on that right Mm -hmm. and so we just get like you know you never the dopamine loop just keeps going because every time i'm anticipating getting more information seeing something new um, and it's just that constant stimulation is really what what we're after. It's not even, you know, the reward of the information. It's just, you know, constant new, new, more, more, more. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I also agree from what you said that nobody's ever immune to resisting cravings. Like, like this thing, my phone for your... It's just my little Skinner box, and I'm always surprised how, <laughs> how often I check my phone. I'm like, <laughs> you check. Well, it. and you know the phones, and I I don't think that hey, I got to I'll hold mine up, you know, phone. Mm. I don't think that, you know, when this thing was invented, it was under. I'm sure it was not understood. What, what that would entail, but it's got you know. So first of all, perfect dopamine loop, right? There's always something new, right? You can just go check your whatever feed, you know, your Twitter feed, your Facebook feed, your whatever, right? There's always new information. So that's part of it. Secondly, it is really great at all the things that make conditioned habits um, become conditioned. You know, it's, it's stuff happens unpredictably, like you get a text message, you're not, you know, you can't say I'm going to get a text message at three minutes after the hour, you don't know. So the fact that things come in unpredictably, that makes it easier to become, you know, a conditioned response. The fact that there's a small physical movement, because we know that these physical movements, tap, tap, scroll, scroll, these little muscle movements, make it easier to do a conditioned response. And then the other thing that you've got going is, um, you know, there's some wonderful research that shows that, that it comes to represent your entire social network. This is your, this is your social network. This isn't just a phone. Mm. This is all your family and friends and all your social connections. And, you know, we're really social animals. So this becomes the way I'm socially connected in a way that a desktop or a laptop is not. And so no wonder, you know, we're like, you know, so attached to our phones. It's, it's got everything. It's got our dopamine hits. It's got our conditioned response. It's got our social network. You know, it, it was, it was destined to be as powerful as it is, but I don't, I don't know that we, I don't think anyone saw that coming. You definitely succeeded in ma- making me take <laughs> take action <laughs> because yeah. I don't know if it's about the the hypnotizing <laughs> the part of I the swirling I know of yeah. the book. Um, if if you would mentor three aspiring entrepreneurs and teach them something about persuasion, and you would get ten percent of their future income for the rest of their lives, what would be the first three things about persuasion that you would teach them? Well, first of all, you know that if I get a percentage of their income, that's a reward. That might not be the best way to motivate me, right? Oh. Okay. So, what would be what the would, three what things would be I the would? Best way? <laughs> what would uh, what would be the best way to motivate me? Yeah. In that in that situation. Yeah. Wow. Oh, let's see. Since you talk to me, contribution must be high on your value list. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it would be. If I knew that by helping them, 
you know, they were going to succeed and do something really new and different and interesting, Mm. that would probably mean a lot to me. And as long as they, you know, told everybody I was their mentor, I think I like (laughs) fame. I like fame more than fortune. Anyway, um, so what would be the three things I would tell and aspire? Ask the question again. If you were to take a handful of 30-year-old entrepreneurs and you would get 10% okay. of their future earnings, but you can yeah. only teach them three things about persuasion, what would they be? I would definitely teach them about self-stories. Mm. I think self-stories are like probably the most powerful persuasive, motivational technique. The stories we have about ourselves, about why we do what we do, a lot of those stories being unconscious, we're not even aware of them. Those self-stories absolutely drive our behavior. And there are ways that you can impact and change those self-stories if you know the science of it. And that's, uh, I mean, I really got to credit Dr. Timothy Wilson, who wrote the book um, Redirect, and also wrote the book, uh, uh, Strangers to Ourselves, The Adaptive Unconscious. So I think um, I would definitely say, uh, understand how powerful self-stories are, understand how to change self-stories, and um, that, that will that's huge. So that's one. Probably the second one would be, uh, don't underestimate the power of the fact that we're social animals and the, the motivational driver I talk about in the book, which is the need to belong. People will really do a lot to, to join and stay part of a social group. And that's, that's a really important motivator. And then, um, let's see the third one. What would I say with the third one? Um, I'd probably talk about uh, the, how powerful stories are and about the idea that uh, if you want to communicate effectively, you need to do it in a story format because that's the natural way that our brain processes information. So those would probably be the three. I have to do some thinking about them. I want to be efficient with your time, so let's move to yeah. the last yeah, section. Yeah, on the clock here. Okay. Yeah, on the que- the last uh, part of the interview is the I call it grow questionnaire. It's just a rapid fire section of a very easy uh, or very okay. quick answers. All but right. b- before that, where can where can people find you? People can find me on Twitter at the Brain Lady, and then probably just at my uh, let's see, Twitter, uh, my website, which is. Uh, www.theteamw.com and I would have check out our, our podca- podcast called Human Tech Human Two Tech. words, Human Beautiful. Tech I put it all on the show notes Good stuff. Okay, great. Let's go So what is your favorite word? Word? Word Observe, Observe. What is your least favorite word? Argue Argue <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what noise do you love? I love the noise of frogs in the spring. Beautiful. What noise do you hate? I don't like any high-pitched drill sound. <laughs> okay, then you can't live in Hamburg because around my area is a lot of that. All noise. high-pitched drills? Ugh, okay. Awesome. What's a question you think people should ask themselves more often? What are my self-stories? What are my self-stories? Um... I borrowed this question from Art Markman from my last interview. What's a question I should have asked you in your opinion? <laughs> <laughs> oh, what, what question should you have asked me? Because it's so hard to not just exchange oh, okay, information I got that one. we already know. Yeah. How come I finished my PhD when so many people don't? Ah. Ah. Want to answer it? Okay. I'll try and make it quick. Let's see. I decided that what I really wanted to do was get the PhD and that I I didn't have to learn everything there was to learn before I got my PhD. I could keep learning afterwards. So I made decisions to get myself out of school. So I purposely like decided what to study because it was going to be realistic to do that in a short time frame for my PhD dissertation. I uh, specifically put together my committee, because you get to choose, 
based on faculty members that I thought would help move it along <laughs> rather than I didn't pick the most famous person because mm. uh, that might, you know, we might take too long. So I just made a lot of decisions from the beginning. I made a lot of decisions to get get it done as quickly as possible, knowing that I could I could keep learning afterwards. Beautiful. Last question. If you could put a life slogan on every coffee mug in the world, what slogan would that be? Okay, that one I know. That is uh, observe, accept, let go. Beautiful. Thank you so much for your time. I know you're yeah. running, you're running on a clock. Yeah, Isn't I have it? another meeting I have to go to. I have really enjoyed it. I just love. I'm looking forward to read the other of your stuff. I put all of your books in my book club, and okay. this really meant a lot to me. And I'm excited. So uh, you really uh, made my day worldwide today. <laughs> thank, thank Thanks, you Danielle. All Bye. the best. Well, folks, this was today's episode. I hope this could add some value to you guys. This podcast still is in its experimental phase, so please let me know what you liked and didn't like. You can let me know on my blog, danielkareem.com, or on social media. As always, thank you so much for listening, and tune in next time.